we will look at the betrayal of Jesus. We will look at the Passover celebration and upon which Jesus finally is betrayed and handed over. We will look at how Jesus predicts the reaction of Peter. And Peter cannot believe that Jesus thought he would, be, he would deny him. Someone too preoccupied with money to the extent of betraying the Messiah. We get the part that now they are having the Lord's Supper. And it says, as they did it, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, break it, and gave to them and said, take it. This is my body. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you see, if, if you don't understand the significance of the Lord's Supper, uh, you, you, may not really, you may not really appreciate salvation. Humanity at its best is vanity. Mm. And, and, and for me, I look at Peter's situation as, I mean, a situation that defines all of us. It is all of us. But what does it point us to? It points us to entire and total dependence on God if success is going to be sure. Mm. From the book of Mark 14, uh, verse 32 to 42. He tells of, of, of one who has fed with his disciples and one who knows that the hour is growing close in which he, those whom, with whom he has labored for three and a half years, one, um, they're go, they going to be embarrassed of him and run away mm. and another would even do what, betray him and sell him uh, eventually to be crucified. The quick lessons for me to apply to my, my life and to our lives is to ask us those important questions. One, do we know who we are mm. in God? The second question is, are you that person? Have you found yourself in Christ? Are you the same person in public and in private? Mm. And then thirdly, when push comes to shove, are you willing to preserve life at the expense of your testimony? Or are you willing to preserve your testimony, even if that means to be at the sacrifice of life? Mm. Who are you? Happy Sabbath and good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you're joining us from on this beautiful World Pathfinder Day. As you can see, our elder Jared is well representing as well as as our elder chief wherever he is. It is good to have you this morning and welcome to New Life SDA Church on this Sabbath morning. I hope you've had a great week. The Lord is good and safely through another week and I thank God for being alive this morning. My name is Masi Odor. I will be on your moderator this morning and with me is my panelist. Uh, shall we start with you, Elder Jared, as we introduce ourselves? Happy Sabbath. My name is Jared Manyara, a member of this church and a panelist today in this World Pathfinder Day. Amen. Be blessed. Happy Sabbath, brethren. My name is Seraphine Okemwa. Glad to be here. Amen. Happy Sabbath, uh, everyone. My name is Raphael Onsongo. Uh, it's a wonderful pleasure to be with you this blessed Sabbath day. Amen. And online joining us is Elder Chief. Hi. Elder Chief is glad to join you today. Amen. And Saya? Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be part of this team. Thank you very much. I will ask Elder Jerry to pray for us this morning. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for your mercies upon us. Thank you for giving us life. Lord, this morning we are delving into your word. I will pray, Lord, that you lead us. As we continue looking at the book of Mark, and today as we continue with the trial of Jesus and the crucifixion, Lord, we pray that you reveal your will to us. The Lord, we may be committed in our lives and be able, Lord, to represent you in this world, even as we proclaim the message of Christ saving humanity. This humble prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Last week we looked at taken and tried. We looked at Jesus going through quite a lot at the Garden of Gethsemane facing the Sanhedrin. He has now faced the Sanhedrin. And now we see Jesus has to face Pilate. And that is, we're looking at that from Mark chapter, uh, chapter 15. And we see Jesus going to the cross for you and me. 
So he finally goes to, cru uh, to crucifixion. But before that happens, he faces Pilate. From there, Pilate is forced to decide whether it is Jesus or Barabbas and who the people would take. And interestingly, who did the people take? We'll get to find out. We see the king on the cross. It is not every day that you see a king on the cross. So we get to see the king on the cross. The king dies and is buried. What a sad, sad day. Actually, we said that this, this, this lesson, this, um, this chapters of Mark, really look 15 and 16. Actually, 14 and 15 took part in a week. So this is what is going to happen between Friday. Um, uh, actually, pretty much Friday. So this is what is happening between Thursday and Friday. Then we see Jesus dies and what happens after that. So this morning, we're looking at these chapters. And, we, and the writer of the, of the lesson this week was talking about, you know, the fact that this chapter is filled with irony. And irony, we're saying, is an expression, of, a statement of expression that contrasts the expectations and realities. So what really does that mean? Because it's important for us to understand what irony is so that we'll be looking at the different ironies that are presented in this chapter. So irony contains three components as per our writer. Two levels, of, two levels of meanings, so two levels of meaning in a statement. And then part two is that the two levels are in conflict and contrast of each other. And somebody does not see the irony and does not recognize that what is happening and does not know he or she is the one who will suffer the consequences. That's a very interesting statement, my panelists. But we will see this playing out in the entire lesson as we look at the whole of chapter 15. And we'll see different types of ironies. Now, Elder Manyara, I want to come to you this morning because we are looking at uh, a certain type of irony that we will see in chapter 15, verse 1 to 15. And our, our lesson for this day is looking at when Jesus is brought to Pilate, Pilate is, is confused because Pilate is under saying, why? Pilate, deep down in him, knows that this man is innocent. And the only thing that he could see, the reason why he's been brought to him is because he's been accused of claiming to be the king of the Jews. And he asks him, are you the king of the Jews? So, Elder, is he the king of the Jews? Okay, thank you, sister. Uh, this is uh, a very interesting question. Are you the king of the Jews? And uh, the question looks like um, Pilate didn't know. Or he wanted to confirm. Mm. When he's brought, uh, when Jesus is brought to Pilate, uh, it is not very clear what he's being accused of. But from this question, we can see that the Jews are accusing him of claiming to be a king of the Jews. And interestingly, uh, we know from the Old Testament that. Uh, Kings had to be anointed. We can remember the story of uh, Samuel anointing David. Now, when we look at Jesus, who anointed him? Mm -hmm. These guys didn't know. Mm -hmm. And the irony is that kings were anointed by men. Now here, Jesus is anointed by a woman. Mm. <laughs> that, that, mm. that, that's the first irony. Yeah, but now these guys are saying, how can uh, this guy be a king of the Jews, yet he has, been, uh, he has not been what? Anointed. So, it is like they were accusing him of usurping power mm. which he did not have. And that means he was taking uh, a seditious action, mm. claiming to be a king when there is what? another king now jesus was a king and the messiah he was actually supposed to to have received homage and also to be worshiped but now instead of that he is being accused of uh, sedition and blasphemy because they don't see how it serves to be a king. Now, Pilate uh, wants to confirm this. He asks. Now, Jesus confirms in verse 2 of chapter 15. Jesus answered and said to him, 
it is as you say. So he confirmed he was what? The king. The king. But that was not all. The chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. That was the irony. You are accused, you don't answer. Even Pilate was very confused why he could not answer. So, um, uh, Pilate had this custom of releasing one prisoner uh, during the, the, the feast. Passover. Yes, yes, the Passover, yes. Now, <clears throat> Pilate, looking at Jesus, he realizes Jesus is innocent. Now, how do I get out of this mess? And he's being accused. And he's seeing these people are determined that Jesus must be killed. So, when he saw that these people were envious of him, he decided to ask the crowd. But he didn't know that he was playing into the hands of the leaders again. You know, this is another irony. He wants to be free of this crime. But again, the leaders start up the crowd. Mm -hmm. So he finds him in a, a catch 22 what? Situation. situation. Mm. Now, he asks, whom now do we do what? Release. Release. Mm -hmm. They say, Parabas. Mm. Now, he's confused, but now he had no choice. Since the crowd had demanded for this one, he just released this one. And for Jesus, he was told by the crowd, crucify him. But still, he wanted to try his last chance to release uh, Christ. Mm -hmm. In verse 14, he asks the crowd, why, what evil has he done? Mm -hmm. The guys were not bothered with that question. The only thing they wanted is what? Crucify him. Crucify him. And that was it. So, Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Mm -hmm. The funniest thing is that here we see Barabbas, who was a murderer, being released. Jesus, who is innocent, being crucified. But the beauty of all this is that Barabbas first experienced the grace of Jesus. Mm -hmm. What they did with it, that's not our part. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine you are going to be killed, yet someone offers to take yep. your place. Mm -hmm. So you find there's several ironies here, as we have seen from the anointing, from... Uh, Pilate playing into the hands of the leaders. Mm. Christ being accused instead of being uh, praised and worshipped. Mm. And it is amazing. And this is not very different from what we human beings normally do. Mm. We normally do the opposite. Um, I don't want to <laughs> give some examples. But uh, there was one time the people demanded to be given uh, a thief as their leader. Mm. That is the funniest thing. I can see it very practically here that man who is sinful is a big problem, not to society, but to himself. True. And I can remember these people saying that let his blood be on us and our children mm. to the fourth generation. And as we have read history and the Bible, uh, we are aware that the Jews have never known peace, even up to now. Mm. Thank you. Ah, Raf, this is a lot of pressure. As you can see, you can see uh, it's very interesting that we have a pagan governor who wanted to release an innocent man. But because of the pressure around him, he, he, he falls to pressure. So how do you, for example... How do you keep from following the crowd when the pressure is too great? I think uh, it's something that, is, uh, that plagues all of us, mm. and not only politicians, but perhaps 
more for the politician who, who wants to play to the country and to, and to secure a good standing with people because it almost, in essence, secures his future. But I believe, I think, for us as Christians, it is important to choose our audiences mm. right. And, um, and I think uh, there's a concept of the audience of one. Or, uh, and, and that one being God. Mm. That if we are to look at how Christ summarized the commandments, that you first and foremostly love the Lord your God mm. and put him first. And then secondly, to love your neighbor as yourself. That means coming uh, to the aid of those who are within our vicinity and within our world and uh, within our capability to help them. And so I believe um, having first fidelity to god mm. chiefly mm. Uh, beyond uh, before all others before even parent before father before mother before tribe uh, before kindred having that fidelity to god and practicing it um, and 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 and, um, and making it a habit then it protects us from these aspects of peer pressure mm. that are there and are per per permissive in society today very true saya let me come to you with a random question, because in our world today, there must be Barabbases. Are there Barabbases that get to be asked for by the society instead of Jesus? Um, yes. Anytime we, there could be many. Um, a few that just popped to my mind is us sacrificing truth. Mm. Um, every time the Bible truth is cutting at us, when we ask that is sacrificed, and in its case, we are given more pleasant things to hear or a gospel mm. customized to self, that's a form of um, intellectual Barabbas. Um, every time we give up our God-given identity, just simply because it asks us to take up the cross and follow Christ daily, and instead go around manufacturing our own um, identities through um, our own effort or our own sweat or through the fabrication of our life online, that's a Barabbas that we are creating. Mm. Every time we um, um, take up elements of the secular creed, like you only live once, or mm. you are your own boss, or mm. love is love, or um, um, no one should be the boss of you, mm. all of those things that center self mm. and eliminate God from the picture on the throne room of the heart, that's enthroning a Barabbas. Mm. So we could do intellectual Barabbases, we could do philosophical Barabbases, mm. we could do practical everyday Barabbases. And any time we are pushing out God and his claims in our lives mm. and enthroning something easier or smoother, that's a Barabbas within our lives. Very true. Thank you so much. Elder Chief, let me come to you. Because now here we see soldiers. In all this, they, are, they get caught up in this because they have their boss who is the pilot. And the pilot says, you know what? Hand him over. Take him. Beat him up. Hand him over to the people to crucify him. And they literally play the part. And in this, you can see them mocking Jesus to a point where they're saying, hail the king of the Jews. Take us through this. Even as we see men who, in this case, we may think were innocent, but that will never excuse their actions when it comes to the judgment. What do you think? Well, th thank you very much. Uh, it, it's, it's one thing. It's one thing for, or, for the Jews to be willing to treat another Jew, considering the hatred the Jews had for the Romans who were like their oppressors, the people who had colonized them. It's one thing for them to be willing to trade another Jew. That shows you the level of hatred they had for Jesus. Mm. They could simply trade him and have him mocked. And uh, this was this was not really funny uh, mm. if, if you look at it. Because first of all, if your king is the one who is being trolled, it's not funny. Mm. You don't laugh at that. You don't laugh at somebody cracking a joke about your father mm. and then you're part of the team that is joining you to celebrate and 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 this this you can find clearly you see the the hatred that the jews or, or the chief priest had for jesus christ had pushed them to the level whereby they made it look like jesus is one to be despised mm. they were willing to even in in fact as my brothers put it de demanding for barabbas they were willing to but trade anything 
for their saving. Mm. And and when you look at it, um, they went with this. This was their chief accusation yeah. to Pilate. And when they went with this accusation to Pilate, Pilate bought the idea that you people have accused him and you feel like he is worthy of death because he is calling himself the king. And the, 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 the habit in that time was that when somebody is going to be crucified, you have to put what is he the crime been. of this person. Mm. And so the crime there is written as, the, the soldiers are actually given instruction that you will write on his, the nameplate, the crime. Mm. You're going to write, this is the king of the Jews. Yeah. And, and when you read uh, in uh, John 19, John 19, 19 says, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. The writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Mm. The title was read, me, me, was then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. And they then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, mm. but write that he said, He's I am the king of the Jews. Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. Mm. What am I reflecting on this, even as we look at Mark chapter 15? Um, the soldiers are leading Jesus, but it seems like this accusation of Jesus, while it was meant to be a mockery, it is actually achieving something. The truth is being told. Be careful when you think you are mocking the Savior. You may just be preaching the gospel. That's why stones will cry out. And the soldiers thought they were mocking Jesus mm. when in actual sense, all the things that they did for Jesus was not really mocking Jesus. Mm. While they targeted to mock Jesus, there's another text that all things work together for good. Mm. While they targeted to mock Jesus, everything that was for mocking Jesus was emphasizing the role that Jesus came to do. Amen. And, and so, as the king of the Jews, it's coming out clearly that even these people, by the way, when you're going to reflect on this, you're going to find that they're not now, there's no excuse for them. Mm. For the soldiers to have mocked Jesus, they used a term that should only be used for mm. the, the emperor himself. Mm. And, and can you imagine wanting to mock a prisoner then you welcome him the way he, the, the, the presidential, uh, the, the, the president is normally welcomed, his excellency and all those wonderful terminologies. Mm -hmm. That is what they did. Mm. So when they're saying hail him, they, they, they're not even saying condemn the king of the Jews. Mm. They are hailing the king of the Jews. And, and, and you see, uh, looking at this again, it says that they clothed him with purple. And that is the color of royalty. Mm. So it, they're trying to stage something here, but in actual sense, I think even the Jews themselves who are watching this scene mm. should have seen that this is actually not normal. Mm. Because they, 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 they put for him a crown of thorns on his head and they began to salute him. They smote him and they, they were spitting on him. They were even bowing their knees to worship him. Mm. That is what verse 19 says. And, and, and when you look at this, it says they mock him, took off his purple from him and his own clothes. They led him out to crucify him. Mm. This entire scene brings a Jesus whom, and, and it, it, it portrays to us a Jesus whom we should understand who he is. Mm. And in, in, in Mark chapter 15, I think the, 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 the key point over here is Jesus is the king of the Jews. Mm. When, when, when Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, he's the king of the Jews. Mm. That is clear. When now we, we are finding uh, the, the soldiers mocking him, and we are going to find even the chief priests in the succeeding places mocking him. And all through, one thing is coming out clear. Jesus wants to be, no, not that Jesus wants to be. Jesus is yes. the king of the Jews. Amen. Jesus is the king, even is our king is the mm. king of kings mm. so despite the fact that people mock him it doesn't change in fact i i i like the way you played with the word iron mm. the iron here is you can deny you can mock him mm. but the truth is he's the Charming. king mm. 
I've, I've always thought for myself, what if Jesus just stopped for one minute and decided to say, okay, let me show these people I am the king. Mm. I, I, I like saying as chief, I think I would have been pushed to do that. Mm. If, if I had the capacity to prove that I am the king and people are mocking me for being a king, I would have that royalty for just one minute, prove it to them and then go back to normal. <laughs> but Jesus in his humility, mm. he, when you are a king, you don't have to prove that you're a I king. Did. And I think that's why King Jesus just kept calm as, as they were mocking him. Mm. And he hoped that these people would come to their senses. Amen. Seraphim, if I could ask you, I know we've always said that ignorance is no defense. And it, it is no defense in a, law, in a court of law. This man may not have known what they were doing, but why do you think this, their ignorance will not excuse them on judgment day? I want to rope in with what uh, Chief has said. Two things. It takes an extremely dead conscience not to be able to realize it is abnormal to go through all this and not behave like all the rest whom we have taken through all this. I mean, he was silent. He didn't respond. He didn't, rea he didn't retaliate. And secondly, what did they do? with what they knew. Mm. What did they do with what they knew? Because they did not know. Maybe, let's say, they did not know that truly he was the savior. But these people were mocking, were spitting at him, were being very sarcastic and mocking him, kneeling in front of him and saluting him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Indeed, peradventure, they may not have known this was the King of the Jews, but what did they do with what they knew? And, you know, it, it, it takes me back to even we as Christians. And, you know, it was, in line with their, it was in line with their calling as the Roman soldiers to really hit hard on their subject. But they went over and above and beyond, right? We as Christians today, we could be Adventists and we are proclaiming the gospel, we are doing what we need to do, but we are very unkind, we lack courtesy. And allow me to read a quote in a book, uh, Patriarchs and Prophet 237, paragraph 2. Uh, she says, Those who profess to be followers of Christ and are at the same time rough, unkind, and courteous have not learned of Jesus. Their sincerity may not be doubted. Their uprightness may not be questioned, but sincerity and uprightness will not atone for a lack of kindness and courtesy. So I would like to know, mm. they did not know this was the king, not only of the Jews, but of the universe. Mm. But what did they do with what they knew? Amen. Raf, we see the Savior going to the cross Truly, he is going for crucifixion. And they, uh, we looked at last week, we looked at Gethsemane. And when he, t he, he prayed if the cup could move from him. And the father just let him take the cup. So we see him drinking the cup. Talk to us about the crucifixion. Indeed, um, the cross is a, is, a, <clears throat> is a crossroad for many. Mm. Uh, if I was to play with the words. But the cross uh, is, is significant to us as Christians in that uh, it is a symbol a symbol of uh, of of our of our of our savior dying for our sins and um, and it is it is significant in that um, the author of the lesson for this particular week is dwelling on the ironies mm. of the situations uh, as 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 Christ is making his way uh, eventually to die on the cross for the sake of all of us and 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 we are told that at some point, his body got weak. Mm. As we read from Mark 15, verse uh, 21, it says, And they found a man called Simon of Cyrene, mm. and they compelled him. The Bible records they compelled him to carry the cross. Mm. I think it is ironical that he who is bearing the sins of the world mm. cannot bear the cross. Mm. That, uh, that, that, that Christ, who, who, he who is God, is, is, is now struggling with this with this with this wooden thing this artifact uh, another 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 preacher says that uh, as 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 the chief was saying he was holding back mm. 
You know, he, so one, one, one says he could have ordered it to levitate mm. and it, it, it could have, gravity would have given way. Gravity would have given way and, and, and things would have happened. But we see uh, Christ holding back, holding back, being mocked. And eventually they, they come to him and they tell him he saved others. Why can he not save himself? Mm. In essence, they are now confessing that all the things that he has been doing, mm. he has been doing good things. Even if they were, they were saying he, he, he's, he's a bad fellow, but they knew that he was saving others. Mm. And they were calling him a savior. But they're asking him, savior, save yourself. Mm. As he said, uh, in, uh, he prophesied that uh, indeed they will ask him, physician, heal yourself. Mm. And so, but in staying up on the cross, uh, the, the author tells, tells us that still he was still being a savior mm -hmm. because in staying up on that cross he was still saving us mm -hmm. he was still even saving them and that is the irony of the crucifixion that is the irony of the crucifixion mm -hmm. that the son of god condescends and i think it's a mystery of godliness that god becomes man mm -hmm. and he endures uh, so much ridicule so much frustration i believe even uh, amongst us as human beings i think one of the most draining things the most uh, testing things is where, where you have the power to do something and you're being provoked actively mm. and you still don't do it. Mm. I think that, that, that self-reserve, that self-discipline speaks a lot about the commitment of Christ mm. to secure our salvation, to secure our salvation. And so um, it was ironical that they called him savior and they were mocking him. Mm. Yet on that cross, he was dying to literally save them. And so it is ironical that he is crucified and numbered amongst the transgressors. Yet the Bible records Isaiah when he speaks, he says he has come to look for the transgressors, mm. to set the captives free. And on that cross, Christ saved us all. Mm. That thief on the cross was saved that particular day. And so um, the crucifixion speaks joy to us mm. in as much as uh, it, 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 it spoke a lot of pain and, and a lot of uh, degradation, a lot of, um, a lot of hu humiliation. But we are told also that he who died as a lamb mm. will come again as a lion. Amen. And so uh, there is, there is, um, there is uh, uh, that consolation. But until then, um, we glory on the cross, mm. as the hymn writer says. At the cross, at the cross, be my glory ever. Amen. You know, it's, it's really ironical that the only reason why Jesus couldn't save himself is because he had to save us. And he could only save us if he went through with this death. So it is an irony of the crucifixion. Seraphim, let me come to you. And our memory text for today is um, Mark fifteen thirty four, And the Bible says that at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which translates, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God forsake Jesus at the cross? I want to say no. But the reality is yes. Mm. Why? Actually, the answer is yes and no. And I will explain it. Why? Because God was made sin. Christ was made sin that we may become the righteousness of God. Indeed, God could not with favor look at sin. And you know, sin cannot be saved. It must be forsaken. Ideally, it must die. And God was in Christ Jesus reconciling us to himself, but he had to suffer the penalty which we were to go through if we would be saved. And for that reason, Christ was forsaken of God because of sin. But indeed, was God absent? That's the question. Was God absent? And I want to look at a time when God was extremely present in the life of Jesus and compare it with the cross. And that was during the baptism of Jesus Christ. When he was being baptized, 
there is a parallelism that is drawn between his baptism and his crucifixion. When he was being uh, baptized, Jesus Christ indeed terms it as a baptism. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit, ready for ministry. Indeed, we know he was filled with the Holy Spirit right from the beginning. But now, even more evidently, as the dove comes down, and indeed, a voice is heard. Again, he calls his suffering a baptism. Mm. And what was this baptism? It was a baptism by the suffering he went through and ultimately the death. In the book of Mark chapter 10, verse 38, he actually talks about it as a baptism of suffering. Mm. The second parallelism is indeed John is termed as the Elijah of the day by the people of the day because of his spirit. They say the spirit of, of Elijah was in him. And he is the one who baptized Jesus Christ. And at the cross, they actually hear Christ speaking, and what do they say? Behold, he calls forth Elijah. And you know, Elijah is still central, even during the time of his transfiguration, mm -hmm. when he comes down to do what? To encourage him, to comfort him along his path. I think we might want to think deeply about why Elijah. But I go to the third parallelism. It is heaven splitting. And at his baptism, heaven split. And what happens? A voice is heard. A voice is heard. And again, here, the veil is rent into twin. Just like his garment is again split. Things fall apart right there. The other parallelism is the spirit comes down in form of a dove and indeed Christ is filled with the Holy Spirit at his baptism but on this other side mm. we are told he gives up the spirit mm. he gives up the ghost but the ultimate parallelism is the declaration mm. of his identity Amen. whether at the, big, at the, at the peak of his, you know, ministry as he begins it, at the crowning of his ministry, or at his death. When he was being baptized, there was a voice that came forth saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And though this time round the voice never came from heaven, but flesh and blood did not reveal to this very man who was ordained to inflict pain, sorrow, grief, and death onto our Savior. Mm. It is the Spirit of God that inspired him to say, indeed, this was, this was the Son of God. Mm. These parallelisms actually convict me to say, God may have appeared to be absent, but he was extremely present. And because of his presence, he strengthened Christ to go through what he must and he had to go through. Mm. If our fate should not be one of um, eternal damnation and eternal doom. And when I look at this experience, for me, it speaks a lot of hope. Mm. That those days when I feel God is far, God is absent, God is not in my circumstance. He is not in my situation. I am forsaken mm. of the Lord. He is extremely present. Mm. And that is why I I'm not giving way mm. to the circumstances around. Amen. Yeah. Elder Chief, we see a situation where this, this, the evil plotting of men, yeah? so in spite of all this plotting, we still see God's purposes fulfilled. So for you, in terms of helping us learn, regardless of what happens around us, that we can still trust God and know that his goodness will ultimately prevail. Sure, sure. God's goodness will ultimately prevail. And, and just as uh, my sister has put it clearly, th there's something I like uh, saying that uh, I, I don't play chess, but I, I learned a few words about che chess. There, there's something I had called checkmate 
Mm. And and I think it's almost like you've done your best move. And 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 so and and those who play these other games, card games and everything, mm. you, you know that moment when you feel you've done your best move. So the devil gets to the point where the devil has just done his best move. And I think mm. in trying to deal with with these issues, he tried in the wilderness, command these stones to turn into bread. He's, he's been trying, but this seems to be his ultimate best move. Mm. And in fact, even the chief priest thinks think like for once they've achieved it. Mm -hmm. But when I see how this is handled, it gives me the assurance that God can be trusted. Amen. Because God says, when the devil has done his best move, I am willing to go beyond that best move mm. and and offer the best. And and, and that's why when uh, he is talking about Eloi, Eloi, and we know that he's saying, God, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? And this the, the sin separated from God and all that. But we see that God the Father is interested in this. We see that God the Son is interested in this. And I am convinced that salvation has God's interest. Salvation has God the Father's interest, has God the Son's interest, and has God the Holy Spirit's interest. All this, we are seeing them together. And so when you are asking, can we trust that the goodness of the Lord will prevail? I would say, mm. if he was willing to take the worst that the world could offer mm. so that he can give us the best that heaven can offer, then I think that ultimately tells me the best is yet to come. Amen. We can trust in God that when it looks bad, and, and Jesus went to the point whereby he's saying, this is tough. But we are seeing, he's saying, for your sake, I am taking what is tough. Amen. Now, can we take these light, tough things? You know, mm. Jesus took the tough, tough. Can mm. we take the light, tough things? Mm. It, it's possible. His Amen. goodness will prevail. Amen. Amen. Sire, it is interesting that uh, all this is happening on a Friday. So all this, it's a lot. It's a lot even for any human mind to just be able to go through. But suddenly we find ourselves, it's almost Sabbath hours, and they hadn't thought about how Jesus is going to get buried. So his body is hanging there. Jesus has died. And suddenly it's like nobody really knows who's going to bury and where we are burying and all that. And we see an unlikely intervention talk to us about the laying to rest of jesus his body it's it's an interesting picture because um it brings to the fore in the book of mark one character who appears and a few verses later disappears again mm -hmm. from the entire story his name is joseph he came from a town called arimathea so he's now known as joseph of arimathea mm. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a member of the council. And so right there you see your first irony that the very council that condemned or orchestrated the death of Jesus mm -hmm. is the same place where God had disciples and he is bathing from right there. Somebody who would A, identify with Christ and B, um, stand out and step out for him. Mm -hmm. uh, other passages in the Bible um, do tell us that it wasn't just one person, but it was two. It was Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who came forth to ask for the body of mm. Jesus. One lesson that I learned from there is even in the most hostile of places, we would be quick to dismiss that God is not A, able to touch hearts or B, generate disciples. God says, Give me a minute. Mm. And he does exactly that. Amen. Um, when you read behind the scenes, the conversion of Joseph of Arimathea had been happening over some time. And for a season, he had been not able to vocalize what he believes. But with the death of Jesus, he laid aside his other sources of identity and he identified with Christ. At least for um, Nicodemus, we saw him in John 3 um, having that night assembly with Christ which seems to have had a deep impression with him. Then the second piece of irony is the whole essence of killing Jesus was to silence him and get rid of him. And the reason of doing it through crucifixion was to discredit him. Because from a Jewish lens, 
being hung on a tree was a sign that you are cursed of God. Mm. And from a Roman sense, a people who are crucified were treasonous. Mm. Yet, um, A, when Pilate is asked for the body, um, he's even shocked that A, this guy's dead and he asks for confirmation. And Romans had borrowed um, the cross from the um, Carthaginians and had perfected it. So they knew how to certify death. And the soldier runs the spear on the side and mm. the flow of water and the blood does certify that he's dead. And they take him down. Little do they know that down this road, when there will be individuals, including mm. Romans on the Sunday, who will want to discredit either the validity that he died or the validity that is re resurrected, they would end up running right back to that confirmation that was made by the centurion and subsequently by Pilate that Christ was not just crucified, but he actually died. And so the second thing is, it is ironical which source God allows to serve as one of the biggest confirmations of the central pillar of Christianity, which is in this case the death of Jesus, that it wasn't a Jew, but it was a set of Roman officials. Mm. If you're standing at the foot of the cross on that particular day, looking at all that inhumane treatment that was going on through him, you begin thinking this is over, nothing good can come from it yet. One of the most powerful arguments we have for Christianity today is the veracity of the resurrection. Mm. And it is so because it is confirmed that he died mm. and that the confirmation of death was not made by friends, but by foes. Mm. Then the third interesting thing is what happens is, is a set of women who come and they see where Jesus is being Lame. laid. Now, mm. in that particular time, the um, testimony of women was not held in high regard mm. and generally the status of women was not very high but the bible is very interesting that the women who saw him being laid down to um, rest then go home to prepare the spices and they rest on the sabbath mm. are the same batch or the same lot who are the first to arrive on the tomb um, on resurrection morning and they become the bearers of the news so at times two quick applications is here it must have been very organizing for that lot of women who loved and were close to Jesus to see him being laid to death and the stone being rolled away for them. Um, even the very act of going to prepare the spices was their own admission that for them, this was a wrap. But um, at times God allows us to witness things, not necessarily because it's an end, but so that when he finally comes through, we are able to attribute the power and the victory and the miracle to the right source. In the Amen. words of a favorite song, it says, when there's nothing left to do, mm. but just to depend on God and on the power of his name, then when we come to him, we can know the master's plan. We can extend the master's hand when we come in the strength of the Lord. Amen. And so the second part is that when the women finally come, um, if we if the bible was being cooked as a story the one thing you wouldn't do is have witnesses that are women as being the first and the prime witness mm -hmm. of a resurrection but the reason they are there is because guess what it's true and that god allowed it to be there so in the whole story of jesus being laid down to rest there seems to be things that at face value initially would have seemed hopeless mm -hmm. yet god was using them to engender and create hope the whole chain of ironies, but God was working in them slowly yet patiently mm. to bring out the counsel of his will. Thank you, Sire. Thank you so much. Elder Manyara, how ironical that at this point in time, the followers of Jesus are missing. They are nowhere to be found. Uh, as, as a result, his body is given to a member of the Sanhedrin who hadn't been a follower of Jesus till this point. So how can we be sure as children of God, that we are not missing in action at critical points of our lives. Uh, thank you, sister. <clears throat> uh, in this uh, week's lesson, I have seen uh, two, uh, an irony. God forsaking us mm. and us forsaking God. Yeah? Mm. Uh, there are times we're in so much pain, so much trouble, and we think God has done what? Forsaken us. Forsaken us. Mm. 
do we allow God's will to be done the way Jesus did? Now, on Thursday, we see the very close people of Jesus abandoning him at the hour of need. And this is something that um, we experience every other time. Uh, let me give you an example from my profession. I am a teacher. I have been confronted by situations that demand that I don't miss in action. Mm. One time I was coordinating a program which runs from Monday to Saturday. Mm. A student comes and tells me I'm an Adventist. Mm. I cannot do classes on Sabbath. Sabbath. It was a challenging moment, but I did not miss an action. Uh, we discussed this student took slightly longer, but she was able to honor God. Mm. Another time was when students had an exam on a Sabbath. It had been timetabled, so they came to me for assistance. It was also another challenging moment because I was an administrator. But I want to say that God was gracious to me. Mm. That I didn't miss in action. Mm. Uh, sometimes you may even find you are at the workplace. You are told, okay, we know church is Saturday. Mm. So don't worry. We can work until 8 or 9. Then tomorrow you go to where? Church. To church. Oh. Some people may not be understanding. Mm. What do you normally do? One time I was in such a similar situation, but I remember explaining how it was. It is very challenging for all of us. For us to be able to ensure that we are not missing in action, let us be prayerful. Mm. Especially when confronted with a situation that is very difficult. Mm. You cannot overcome it unless you pray. Mm. Because some of them sometimes seem to be impossible. Look at how poor uh, Peter was. He saw like what Jesus was going through, if he admitted, mm. he could be a partner of Jesus in the suffering. Mm. But he had to chicken out to save his what? His skin. Mm. So we need to be very prayerful and all the time Ask God that when similar, when situations come that are very challenging, give us the grace to go through. It is not very easy. Mm. Some of the situations sometimes you might even almost get overcome mm. if you are not that strong. Because I've seen many people overcome. Not mm. that they're bad or they're weak. Mm. But because sometimes what are you perceiving? Mm. Yes. Amen. And how focused are you on God? Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. My dear viewers, we've almost come to the end of our Sabbath school this morning. I will ask my panelists to think through their closing remarks. But Desire of Ages, book, uh, page 738, the, uh, says that Pilate longed to deliver Jesus. Can you imagine? But he saw that he couldn't do this and yet retain his position and honor. Rather than lose his worldly powers, he chose to sacrifice an innocent life. So the question is, how many to escape loss or suffering in this like manner sacrifice principles? Yeah? Conscience and duty in the, um, conscience and duty point one way, self-interest point another. The current set strongly in the wrong direction and he who compromises with evil is swept away in the thick darkness of guilt. My friends, how many times have you had to sacrifice principle for, for gains, for worldly gains, and also to escape suffering? All his life, uh, Jesus had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercies and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, now at the point in crucifixion and at this point, but now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the father's reconciling face. 
the withdrawal of the divine continence from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was the agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. The separation of Jesus from his father was so painful that he possibly did not feel the physical burden that he was carrying. Beloved of God, this morning, the Lord is asking you, what are you able to give up? You see a man like Pilate? Pilate's honor was too much for him to let go. What is it that is too much for you to let go that you will sacrifice principle for? The Savior separated himself from his own father for our sake. What are you willing to separate from? My, your closing remarks, my panel, is starting with you, Raph. I think um, it is ironical that Christ must needs go to the cross. Mm. Because at the cross, that's where we all first saw the light. Mm. So Christ goes there, not because he wants it. His body was weak. He had been beaten. He had been tormented. He was hungry. The last meal he had had was literally that last supper mm. on Thursday. And he goes through the whole of Friday. And, and, and he eventually gives up the ghost. He lives almost, in essence, in his own terms. Mm. By the time they come to, 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 to check, they find that he has already died. And so it speaks to us, uh, my brothers and my sisters, that in fact people used to die on the cross for very long. Mm. When the soldier came, he thought, he thought it a courtesy to do this man to simply pierce his side, you know, and, 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 and not to break his legs. And therefore he fulfilled prophecy. The, the thing is, generally, if we trust in God, and do his will, then we have trusted in the best person we could ever trust in. Mm. And he will, he will deliver us, and he will see us through. And the cross is significant and is evidence of that, not only of the Father's love, but also of his protection and of his presence. Amen. Seraphine. The irony of all times is that the Bible tells us that two sparrows are sold Five sparrows are sold for two farthings. Hmm. But none of them falls on the ground without our hmm. father's knowledge. Actually, none of them is forgotten Amen. before God. Hmm. But one man, one woman, one child, one is seated somewhere, imagines God has forgotten hmm. them. That is the irony of all times. You are created in his image. Sparrows were not created in his image. Hmm. If he knows their number and they do not die without his knowledge or notice. Amen. He cares for you more than you can imagine. Amen. Elder. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I just want to pick something my sister mentioned on the barrelism. At baptism, God said, This is my son. Hmm. When Christ breathed his last, mm. the centurion said, truly, this man was the, the son, son of, of God. God. What do we say? Mm. After going through this lesson, thank you very much. Amen. Elder Chief. Uh, thank you very much. Mm. Uh, for me, Mark chapter 15 uh, brings in the picture of uh, so many people. There's a lot of things that are taking place. Mm. But the question that really bothers me as we close mm -hmm. is what role do I play in the play and counterplay of life? You see, we have Pilot. He had his role to play. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Barabbas. He had a role to play. And we see everyone, the people who are mocking Jesus, and, and they're also heroes. There is Simon of Cyrene who comes out as a very good hero. There is Joseph of Arimathea who comes out as a hero. So despite what is happening around us, let us just choose which parts of the play and counterplay of life we want mm. to be uh, belong. Are we going to be the heroes or are we going to be the ones who are on the side of negativity? And uh, we can be able to stand with the king of the Jews. We can uh, actually be the ones who are the heroes of the day. Mm. And let us take God at his word and trust him always. Thank you. Amen. And Sire. 
the big difference in the story of the passion was a difference between people who gave lip service, who promised or talked a big game, people like Pilate who knew um, that Jesus was unfairly accused but sought to please individuals, um, religious leaders who gave lip service to the um, letter of the law but massacred its spirit on one end, they gave lip service. And on the other side were individuals who gave love in practice and service. That is called lips, love in practical service. And that is the women who went to prepare the spices. It was Joseph of Arimathea, it was Nicodemus. And so when the story is forgotten, we don't, we, we, we don't remember the names of most of the members of the Sanhedrin, but we remember the names of the women we remember the names of Arimathea, who mm. appears on the scene and leaves the scene very quickly as he appeared. But the reason we remember them and forget the other is one category were lip servants, mm. the other ones people who offered love in practical service. You and I have the opportunity to be lip servants or to be lips in service. Mm. Lip servants <laughs> or lips in service. I pray. Ah, may the Lord guide us. My dear viewers, this morning, we've come to the end of our lesson, powerful lesson. And I hope that as you meditate upon this week, the Passion Week, you will see what Jesus has, died, has done for your salvation and mine. I can't wait for next week to see the risen Savior because this story cannot end here. It just cannot end here. Sunday morning is coming. Sunday morning is coming. I think on Friday, on that Friday, probably by the time Mary went home, the disciples went home and everybody wondered, is this it? What they didn't know but God, because Sunday morning was coming when the Savior was to rise. I don't know what your situation is, my brother or sister, but Sunday morning is coming. Just hold on. Just hold on. It's only Friday. Sunday morning is coming and the Savior shall resurrect the situations of your life that are dead now. Sunday morning is coming. It may be truly that things in your life are dead or people in your life are actually dead, but the resurrection morning is coming. So hold on just a little while because the Lord, the Savior is coming again. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless your families. We see you again next Sabbath as we look at the risen Savior. Shall we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you because this Passion Week is, is intense, Lord. And as we see the suffering that Jesus has been through for our sake, I pray that you will renew the desire in us to walk in your ways, to trust in this Savior. Such a great salvation may not go to waste in me and in my brothers and sisters. Father, may the death of Christ on that cross never be in vain because we shall refuse this salvation. But may we receive this salvation because it's given freely and at a, such a great cost to the Savior. We thank you and we honor you. Bless us this Sabbath morning and continue with us into a new week. Give us an opportunity to meet again the next week. It is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.